Welcome to Right Hive, and today we are talking about uh, nom nom food in and uh, world building. Super happy to have all of our authors here today to talk about their experiences, what they love about using food in their writing, and inspiration, which is always good. We're going to watch a couple of Studio Ghibli films after this, absolutely. Uh, let me start with saying hello to Alicia. Hi. And do you want to tell anybody all my what your latest book is? Oh boy. <laughs> um, so this this year, um, my next YA sci-fi, A Song of Salvation, comes out in July. And my first middle grade comes out in October, which is just a pinch of magic. And as you can tell from the title, it is foodie magic. Yes. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Alma, Stephanie, hello. Glad to have you here today. Thank you. Happy to be here. And uh, what is this lovely book next to you on your screen right there? This book is book one in my sci-fi trilogy. It's called The Merry Maids. Nice. Working on book two right now, right? Book two and book three are done and available on Amazon. Yes. Oh, awesome. Heck yeah. Uh, Claudie, very nice to have you here today. Do you want to yes, tell anybody hi. about a project you're working on? Um, yeah, sure. I'm working on a series of novella that's called Neresia. And they're, um, for this panel, what I will say is that they're set in a world where um, cities became very isolated. So trading for food was very hard. And a lot of uh, identity, local identity developed around what food was eaten and what was av available. Heck yeah. Oh, absolutely. And if we get into food history, I'm going to really enjoy that as well. The 1700s were a very interesting time. All my uh, Barath, hello, all my uh, board member of Right Hive, all my, uh, and welcome to have you here today. What projects are you working on lately? Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, I am working on a sequel to uh, my political thriller, uh, Privilege, uh, and it is South Indian as fuck. A um, lot of <laughs> South Indian food in there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm running, running the prequel right now uh, called Purpose. Nice. Heck yeah. I'm, uh, Tracy, hello. And uh, uh, you're our West Coast uh, 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 participant today for sure. Um, I, uh, welcome. Glad to have you. And uh, what are you working on these days? Yeah, so I am uh, gearing up for the release of my um, middle grade novel. I think by the time this comes out, it'll already be out. It is called The Takeout. It is about a Filipino Indian mm -hmm. fusion food truck and a pair of possibly villainous celebrity chefs that move into town with suspiciously similar recipes. Ooh, very Ooh. cool. Oh um, my, uh, you're reminding me as well. And uh, if anybody knows that the name of the cookbook, you know, like holler for sure. I think it's called uh, Miriam. Oh um, my, uh, there is a Filipino cookbook that has come out in the past month or so that is making huge waves. You know what I'm talking about, right? I do, I do. I have it, I have it downstairs. It's called um, Mayumu by um, Abby Balingit. And it's all these like really cool recipes that I have, I have not tried. And that's like a huge spoiler from my book is that like, I name all these cool dishes that I cannot cook. <laughs> so sorry. That book, uh, it is absolutely beautiful. And just from uh, uh, the, the, the cover, which is like a, a Filipino take on uh, baked Alaska. Yeah. It's so beautiful and amazing colors and stuff like that. It is a science fiction food right there for sure. Like it's it's so awesome. So all um, my uh, let me start off by asking you guys, all um, because uh, definitely y'all are using food in your writing. That's awesome, absolutely. Uh, do you read uh, food reviews or watch uh, kind of like food prep YouTube's? What got you into using food in your writing? All um, my uh, Stephanie, what do you think? I watch sleep. Nina Gomez, I think her cooking series is funny and interesting to watch, but I usually, um, the place where I mostly find food videos is on TikTok, and I'm the one that's like favoriting all the ones because I want to try them. I don't care if it's like an air fryer recipe or a new way of doing nachos or whatever, like I am all about it and I will try it. So, so you, you cook a lot as well? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, yay, absolutely. Oh, my, uh, Barath, oh, my, uh, do you uh, watch food stuff as well as using it, you know, when you're when you're writing? Uh, so I'm I'm definitely a cook. Uh, I love I love cooking. 
Um, I I don't really watch um many cooking shows or or anything like that. Um, I'm I'm just a super foodie. It's how I plan all my travel. It's how um I yeah I I love cooking myself. Um, so that's that was a big part of what brought me into featuring food so heavily in my in my works. If you're doing it yourself, that totally is the same or even more than, you know, like watching or reading food reviews because, you know, you're like able to, you know, reproduce that for the reader for sure. Oh my, uh, Tracy, let me ask, oh my, with the upcoming book, you know, for sure, uh, why is it important to use food, you know, oh my, uh, in your writing to you? Yeah, so in, in the... It is a Filipino Indian fusion food truck. And I kind of used this as a vehicle for um, the mat. There's like, there's magic in it. It's contemporary fantasy, middle grade. Um, and this is going to sound really awful. And I swear I'm not like trying to poison anyone, but what better way to dose people with magic than through their food? Um, so there is, you know, she, uh, the main character like concocts these little like potions and everything. And she's able to kind of test them out at her food truck. Again, not trying to poison anyone. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, any Italian or Mexican, uh, my uh, Jewish grandmother will tell you, like, you know, you can charm charm somebody. You know, you just have to cook them delicious food for sure. There you go. Oh, <laughs> uh, my, uh, Claudie, you like to use food uh, uh, in your writing. Maybe you want to describe that a little bit. And uh, uh, what? why is it important to you to use food in your writing? Well, the place I used it the most is probably in Baker Thief, which from the title you can probably tell involves a baker. And uh, in the course of writing that, first of all, I wanted to learn to actually make croissant myself. Um, so I did watch a lot of YouTube of different people making croissant just to see how they did it until I found a way that worked for me. And so that was one thing I wanted to be able to make all the descriptions around, uh, around the bakery and around the croissant to like work. But also, I built this book to be um, inspired by Quebec City, where I live. But if you take that and you make that fantasy, uh, what happens, especially if you have croissant, is that people will see the Frenchness and they will think it's Paris. And food was one of the major ways in which I could anchor that in my home through uh, what they ate at dinner that was very typical from here. And that was very typical for my own family and youth and all that. And so that's one of the ways I came about really including a lot of it. That's that's great. And it totally does, you know, put you in a place and time to use food in your stuff. I mean, I, I love that for sure. And I uh, the one main way that I can tell I, uh, Quebecois from French, you know, like with my eyes closed, uh, you could say, is this the spelling of some French words for sure? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, very cool. Oh, my. Uh, Alicia, do you want to talk about why it's important to use food in your in your writing? So I have a fun background. Uh, <laughs> I am a uh, classically trained pastry chef. I have my bachelor's degree in pa baking and pastry arts. So you have made many croissants. I have made many of everything. <laughs> so for me, uh, of course, I would do food writing. I, um, I'm also, a, in the past, I was a food critic. So I was published in newspapers and all that. And it was really, really cool. I loved that job. It was like, they just, you just eat for free. <laughs> I loved that. Um, well, at least you get paid something. Food writers, they don't get paid enough. Absolutely. No, but it was really, it was really fun. Um, so since then, it was, it was always in the books for me. If I was going to write books, I was going to have food in them. I'm very good at writing about food, I think. Not to be tooting my own horn, but <laughs> like that's what I went to school for. I took a lot of concentrations in writing for food, about food. Um, so I have my first uh, debut this year with my middle grade, and that's Just a Pinch of Magic, which is a foodie bakery with magic as well. And then, of course, I work with Tracy Badua. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a book coming out next year called The Cookie Crumbles, um, which oh. is a murder, an attempted murder mystery at a cookie competition. It is really, really fun. And um, we've worked together for like seven years. So this is it's been really fun. Yay. No, that's great, guys. Heck yeah. And <clears throat> this is where I see a lot of 
more food in it. You know, like that sounds like a cozy. Is that a, is that a cozy book? I would say so, right? Yeah, and it's middle grade, so that's it why we said grade. attempted murder, guys. There we go. Okay, <laughs> so not even like yeah, murder anyone in middle grade yeah. is attempted. We tried, but <laughs> the manager was like, like, "No, you, you can't save do that. that. Save that for the sequel." You know, oh my. Meanwhile, Goosebumps is killing off people left and right. Yeah. No, we we had to be <laughs> very conscientious about how we killed people and didn't kill people. <laughs> But all my uh, in terms of cozy, all my uh, in terms of middle grade YA and stuff, a lot of times food writing is associated with kind of like vibes over plots, you know, like just in using long descriptions, talking more about it and stuff. Uh, Barath, do you want to talk about Barath? Do you want to talk about how I uh, 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 that's, you know, like true that it's like, you know, if you're writing and including food in it. It means you're you're soft, you know, like in terms of what the plot is, or uh, uh, do you think it, it can be more extensive than that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I see it as as the way I guess I I would see anything as you know gratuitous or not. Um, you're any anytime you're using language whatever the form to to further enhance characterization to further bring out the world building um i think that speaks for itself and stands very well on on its own uh so you know some some people are uh some people prefer uh purple books some people prefer you know not purple language it's i think it's it's much the same um, when you're when you're using food to to enhance the world around you and to uh, bring characterization, um, enhance characterization, I think uh, you wouldn't even notice it. Maybe um, and now, of course, if you're doing it gratuitously, uh, obviously that's gonna uh, pose pose some risks. Yeah, uh, Stephanie, you know, Barath put a great point on it. You know, it purple prose, you know, do you think if you're using food in your writing or you're, you're enjoying reading things that are very inclusive of, you know, food, is it purple prose? Is it excessive to put that in there? I think it depends on the story itself. Um, maybe the characters that you're writing about have an opportunity to really savor the food that they're either eating or creating. And is that indicative of maybe their personality or is it part of family coming together? You know, I know it's not just a Latino thing, but we always come together around the table as a family and it's all centered around the food that we're serving. So it has, um, opportunities, I think, where maybe it could go the wrong direction. But for the most part, when you're including those talks or descriptions of food, it's a way um, to characterize the people, the personalities, to create some identification. The reader might see that um, the main character is talking about ordering pad thai, and they also like pad thai, so now they identify with that character a little bit better. So there are opportunities. There could be maybe some disadvantages, but for the most part, I feel like it's just as important as describing a location in your story as the food that is in as well. Oh, I, I love that about, you know, the location, but also, you know, like I uh, threw on his jacket that was missing three buttons. You know, um, I, I, I had the umbrella that they had just bought and only used once because this was a special occasion. I love how food can tell the reader about your characters very well. Um, I, uh, Claudie, do you want to talk about maybe, you know, how you use food to say things about your characters? I, that's a that's a tough one. I'm trying to think of something specific that I'd, oh, wait, I'm gonna, going to rewind all the way back to my debut novel because I did have a very strong food and character link that was um, the main character only ate instant noodles or near enough. That was like his favorite thing in the world. And um, and it was part, part of the, just of the poverty of the background and access to a lot of things. But as the story progresses, there's a point where we, he does not feel good at all about everything that's happening and he no longer wants the noodles. And I was using that as a marker for his mood. So that's also a thing you can do if you have a pre-established relationship with food. It can tend 
become a tool, right, for whatever else is going on, what the, the themes you have and um, character arcs. So that's, that. that's definitely one way I've used it. That's that's awesome. And I'm sure that Tracy has an example about enchanting someone with <laughs> food that I don't know, maybe they turn their nose up at for first, you know, but like the food convinced them that they needed to go cliff diving after that. I don't know. That, that's so interesting because I think what I'm, I'm getting from a lot of the conversation is the fact that we use food, like the food has to be kind of like it has to be there for a reason, for example, of like, like Stephanie, like you said, the, the detail that it kind of imparts about the characters or even like plot wise. So obviously, um, you know, I use it's a food truck. It serves food. But um, part of the push and pull that the main character goes through is the fact that there are some people in their like super kind of samey town that are like, oh, that food's too exotic for me, like that kind of thing. So that kind of goes into like, you know, oh, is it like, is it me? Am I too like weird for this place? Or like, there's a lot behind there. So it, it kind of is, if we're talking about like purple prose and that kind of stuff, I think if you're just spending like chapters upon chapters describing like this perfect apple and then like you never see the apple again has nothing to do with anything like none someone may want to read it but maybe like not everyone is gonna love that but I like the idea that we're um that kind of all of us are using it as something to you know kind of propel the story forward yeah all yeah. my um, I, uh I'm reminded again as well of a a fa um, a love story which is by Lone Lee um, uh, and how she uses two competing um, uh, restaurants. It's like super low stakes, Romeo and Juliet. Nobody's getting stabbed over it, but the two Vietnamese families hate each other and they, their restaurants cross three from each other. Yet the two children fall in love. And so what each restaurant makes and the specials they're making that night totally hit with you know what that is. But in that book, her descriptions of you know, trying something for the first time or trying a different family's version of that are so, you know, like into it. It's, it's very good. And it's a super cute book that I will recommend, despite not reading romances typically. But I, uh, Baroth, if I can, I uh, kind of ask you the same thing, what you would like to see on um, my, uh, when you're reading books that include food and uh, how you feel it adds to a book. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, Tracy's giving me flashbacks to um, what I would consider one of Hayden Christensen's best works, uh, which is this rom-com he did, Little Italy, uh, with Emma Roberts, <laughs> um, which I think was panned by just about everyone except me. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm i going to give you an example uh, of what I think is, like, food uh world building at its best uh which is uh Fonda Lee's Greenbone trilogy um how she was able to center uh the Twice Lucky which is the restaurant where like the main gang always eats um as kind of just like the staple and it you know book one is a war over turf and you know both gangs are are trying to split up, you know, the the city's turf between themselves. And there's a pivotal moment where the twice lucky falls into enemy hands um, and the, the implications of that. And, you know, when it goes back to um, the main gang's control, how, you know, that's handled, you know, obviously the owner switched allegiances to, to save the restaurant. Um, and uh, the book, it, it, it's fantastic for a number of reasons, but I, I really respected how uh, they 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 centered, uh, you know, in this gang violence and, and this world of um, all these sh constantly shifting elements. They always met at the Twice Lucky and they always ordered the same, you know, food and uh, they always, you know, had great pivotal character moments at the twice lucky. Uh, and so it was, it was a really cool way to, to center uh, this, you know, immersive globe trotting trilogy. Yes. No, I love that. And I uh, thank you very much that you just hit my mental trigger mentioning a, a movie and a book right in a row. So now I totally want to think about 
influences what made you guys love food in writing. And I have two that I think of as my introduction to really loving that. And that is the Red Wall books, all my uh, by Brian Jacques and the Studio Ghibli movies. And just like the amazing bits about food in every single one, but Spirit Away especially. Alicia, do you identify with either of those? Or maybe there was another book um, uh, or film that kind of got you into expressively thinking about food. You might have been a baker since the age of three, for all I know. Well, <laughs> I loved eating more when I was like three. I, I didn't start baking until I was like seven or eight. Um, I, I think a lot about um, Simply Irresistible. I don't know if anybody saw that. That's an old one. Um, and that was magic foodie <laughs> movie that I just loved. Um, I think there were so many different things that I've read now and I'm reading right now, um, Amanda Elliott's best served hot. I think it's something like this, something along those lines. And that's really, really fun and very foodtastic. I love Tracy's work. <laughs> I'm such a fan of hers because she always knows how to do food in such a cool way and she knows how to enhance the scene with it but you can also tell a lot about a character by what they choose to eat and I think you set a scene really well with food but you can also make the scene food and you know there's like those moments in in movies where everybody sits down to eat and then they all like start arguing and nobody eats like I hate those scenes so much but I love the ones where they actually eat. <laughs> so anything that does that already wins for me. Well, there you go with a, and this is film history stuff, but uh, the cook, the thief, his wife and her lover, oh. probably getting the pronouns wrong in there, the, you know, connections, but that is an amazing movie with awesome scenery. And it's all about being in a restaurant. It's so amazing and how it sets the scene with food. Alma, Stephanie, do you have anything to say about maybe your food influences or uh, uh, things you loved as a kid, you know? I uh, also agree. Studio Ghibli, definitely every food that you can see, always you want to try it. Uh, even like um, thinking of Kiki's Delivery Service and just a simple breakfast. Um, I think I'm super susceptible to digestion, though, as well, because I remember, like, watching the Ninja Turtles with my brothers and wanting pizza <laughs> all the time, so. Yeah. Heck yeah, no. Um, uh, Claudia, can I ask you the, the same thing as well? Yes. Um, my, what I would call my studio Ghibli, like, from a very young age, is watching all the banquet at the end of every single Asterix uh Von Disney or or even animated movies, the fact that they always have this big big feast to celebrate is just it it was so big for me and it it really I think it really cemented how important food was as a ritual too, uh, and so that that's the that's the one I really wanted to eat, which is very ironic because my big brother is about to turn forty and that's what he asked for <laughs> as a celebration <laughs> as a celebration meal and I I'm I'm gonna miss it. And I won't oh. have it, but they promised to keep some for me. I, I actually thought I could reach back here and grab an asterisk comic yeah. immediately, but it's it's somewhere else on the shelf there. But... I, I have a library full of them. Oh my god, yes. No, they're they're great. And I they're... even have a collection that's like some in English and some in French, so I can't even read it, but I, you know, beautiful feasts. They're they're falling apart here because we've had them like all of my life. The second one I would really want to mention, the one that made me want to actually put food in my book is probably the Mangover uh, series by Shira Glassman, because there is so much delicious Jewish food described in there and it really sets the saying and it really it made me so hungry and I wanted to have that that effect on my reader it's beautiful no absolutely all my uh broth as a a big cooker have you always cooked your whole life or uh, uh, so I so I only started cooking at the at the age of 23 I I started cooking yeah, I guess 11 years ago now um, is is when I first started getting really into cooking. Um, but thinking about uh, uh, Cloudy, I, I had completely forgotten how important Asterix and Obelix was to me. Um, those are those are incredibly popular comics in India. And so growing up, 
like I would just yeah I I would just read them and every every comic I I believe every comic ends with a feast yeah. um and yeah looking back that that must have been quite impactful uh for for me um yeah I I I think probably that that actually was a, a defining moment in in my literary journey um because yeah I did I didn't I I have very very recently started reading recipe books um but even that I'm not yeah I'm not too big on and it, it's just because I didn't really grow up with that and I have a bunch of recipe books in my house now that I'm sad to say I don't really use that much um no Hey, if you already know everything you want to cook, no problem whatsoever. <laughs> All my, uh, let me shift gears a little bit because Tracy, I'm not going to ask you about how much you cook and how much you love to cook. But what would you say? Because I, I, in our in our intro thing, I put like a Reddit comment where somebody was like, "Why do they always talk about food and books?" Rah rah rah, and it was this big long rant. But what would you say to someone who says, "Why did why would people ever put food?" in their books. I feel like I literally spend most of my day planning like my next meal or thinking what I'm going to eat next. Like this is like the, especially, you know, in the kind of pandemic era where maybe like the hobbies you used to have, like food is the, the joy that you get in the middle of the day, like the nice safe joy that you can just have a little piece of cake and you're like, yay, this is safe. And I'm not getting like, you know, super, super sick, hopefully from it. I, I'm so sorry. I sound like I'm poisoning people. I am not. It's all fiction. It's all fiction. But I feel like the, I feel like that, I don't know. It's just, there's, at least for me, there's so much of my day centered around like, kind of like fun tidbits and like fun food that I can get that I, I kind of throw it into my, into my writing as well. Okay. Okay. So if you don't like food in your writing, you're not a fun person. Oh my, I totally understand that. And I get what you're coming from. It's a hot take, but you know, really stick to I your mean, guns. It's, it's fair. If you're like, what do you guys want to go do? And someone's like, or if half the people are like, let's go to a cool restaurant. And the other one are like, I just want to sit here. Like, oh, mm, no. I, all I, I, uh, Claudie, Alma, do you have any response to people who don't like to read about food in their writing? I mean, people are going to like what they're going to like or dislike, but it's just, as as Tracy said, it's just such an important part of, of everyday life that it feels unavoidable to me if you want to set something concrete, if you want like concrete details in your world. And if your world building what people eat, how they eat it, do they eat together? Do they share finger foods? Do they like that's such a big thing to build the world that I just don't see how you go around it. <laughs> so that's totally. I don't have words for how you're supposed to go around the food completely. I understand that you can kind of tone it down, but it's it's just too big in my opinion to completely avoid. Totally understand. And you know, when you have a protagonist who is just living in a white box and nothing ever happens, you know, you don't know that they eat anything. Frankly, they don't eat. They just go from one scene to the next, you know, like you're not rounding out a person. And Stephanie, um, I, uh, if I can ask you as well, because you brought up, you know, ideas about food relating so much to family and food relating to get togethers. So when you're, you know, like talking about you know, food in your writing or in stuff that you like to read, uh, is there that element as well? Is that, that the food makes, you know, the scene happen? I would say yes. Um, in this story, um, the main character is joining a very small shipboard crew in space. There's only four other people on her ship. And as the newest member, she's literally trying to figure out what is her place in this group. So one of her first bonding moments is when she's sitting on the pilot's deck with a pilot. Um, he like reaches over and offers her um, a can of cashews. And so every time they're sitting together, communing on the pilot's deck, she's literally stealing all of his cashews and she becomes known for doing that. 
in a fun way. Um, also, you know, it's her turn in the kitchen. So she decides to add to the meal some chocolate banana muffins. And in the story, it becomes one of the bonding experiences for her crewmates and she starts having to hide the muffins because they are eating them too fast so it becomes one of the found family um tropes like it feeds into that directly i absolutely love that and you're for you're trying to define a family like you know this is what a family does when they get together that's one thing but the found family thing is awesome so i'm going to bring up another one of my favorites as well oh my uh no fake gloss by essa hansen all my, and if I can just say one little thing here, because it's a sci-fi scene, all my uh, crazy food that they're eating, and she gets to really go crazy with that. But I also love that I uh, uh, use crushed red pepper as my uh, bookmark <laughs> right here. The crew gra- gathered on the floor around a spread of gourmet items. Caden marveled at the meal's textures and colors, reminding him of an assortment of treasures Lita had gathered on her shelves. Colorful glass shells, pressed flowers, feathers, and he, she goes on to say, you know, like uh, uh, that Caden watched transfixed as it puffed with the steaming pockets of steaming air pockets and expanded into a fluffy lattice. Cassine tore this into five pieces and laid them around a bowl of burgundy powder, the source of a heady, nutty aroma. It's an, a sci-fi element I love that is so weird to be like. You know, like this is a grounded scene that we all understand, a found family thing, but you can make it weird, you can make it crazy, oh my, or you can just set it in a place and time that still exists by using food. I love that. Alma, um, uh, Tracy, do you want to respond to that at all? Because I see you going, yes, yes, to that. No, oh, I was just like excited about that, that, that excerpt that you just read. And I totally agree with that. And it, it actually made me think of that scene in the movie Hook, where they are eating but it like it turns out to be like that weird bubble gummy kind of thing but it is like there's that that sense of like it kind of brings everybody together and they're all like kind of thinking of the things that make them happy heck yeah no absolutely (laughs) oh my uh barat oh my uh are you an adventurous eater yourself oh yeah for sure i uh recently went to uh i live in columbus ohio and so um i recently went to a taco place and they uh had a taco that said it had kangaroo um in it and i i talked to the guy i was like what what do you mean and he was like well we imported from australia uh so i definitely tried that uh do not care for it but yeah i mean i've i've had kangaroo i've had barbecue stingray in singapore and um i went i i went on safari in africa was very excited to try zebra uh was told i could not try zebra uh because it's protected for the lions um yeah i'll you know i'll haven't eaten snake would would try snake for sure lived in louisiana ate ate a lot of gator um yeah gator would would not eat rat would not eat rat. Was offered rat in Louisiana. Not interested. It, it was probably Nutria. I'm gonna hope it was. But yeah, gator tastes like chicken. Absolutely. Yep. yep. Um, I, uh, it is. It is delicious, and it sets people apart. If you were to set something in Louisiana and have somebody eating gator, for sure, was reading it in Seattle, they would say, "Gross! This is so weird. This is so insane." But somebody reading it in New Orleans would not. For um, sure. I, I, Claudy, do you want to talk about kind of, you know, um, my, uh, let's say that interplay of food and how it uh, uh, sets up the scenes of your books, but also um, my, uh, in demonstrating kind of kind of a political situation. Um, uh, Quebec City, the English speaking, the uh, uh, French speaking. I've been to Montreal and definitely seen, you know, like some of that happening and where people go matters, where people eat yeah, I've I've not used food for that specific purpose, like the the distinction with the language. I've used street names, and it's not quite Quebec City either. So I kind of I have a lot of leeway there. Um, one thing that happens is what I'm working on right now is that different types of food are only accessible if you have a lot of money. So there's a lot of um, especially when the proteins are concerned, there's a lot of uh, this, this is for the rich people and this is for the poor people. And there's stuff that we would consider completely normal. 
day-to-day uh, -day food like chicken that's actually very rare and that is a celebration meal for them. So that's one way I've used it to distinguish like political situations or well, in this case, it's more of a so social status, I guess. Uh, otherwise to set the scene, it's mostly dinners, celebrations, stuff like that. I've definitely have, have had food that way. It's just, if I need people to sit down and talk or in what I'm working right now, uh, have an excuse to wind up playing board games, which is the, the cozy part of what I'm writing right now is not the food, it's the board games and other variants of games. Uh, food is always there, right? If you sit down with friends, you're usually drinking or eating something. So that happens a lot that way. Heck yeah. Um, I, I, are, are, oh, let, me, let me not leave without asking. Uh, Claudia, are you an adventurous eater yourself? Uh, more or less. I'll, I'll try most everything once. Um, I know I'm not good with spice. I'm, I'm white and I have the taste buds to go with it. Usually I will try and then one or two like bites after I'm like, I'm done. I can't, I can't do it anymore. I'm sorry, I'm crying, but I'll try it. I like trying new stuff. I like going, if I go somewhere, especially if you go somewhere, trying the local food is very important to me. I, I, I don't see myself just going somewhere and finding the next McDonald's or, or whatever. That's just, that's boring. <laughs> No, absolutely. Um, uh, as far as heat goes, I tell you, I have eaten an entire ghost pepper and it uh. is a transcendental experience. Just 15 minutes of sheer terror followed by 15 minutes of transcendental bliss. Like, you know, all of your adrenaline is fired. You're just like, yeah, man, it's all good. It's, it's everything's okay. Yeah, I think that's my, I don't think I could do that. I... I have two friends trying to convince me to eat those very spicy chips that you just put on your and and there's tons of like videos and TikToks of people crying over that and I have still not given in. I don't think yeah, I'm doing it. That's that's not food. That's a, a very <laughs> that's painful medicine or yeah. a little bit of a little bit of poison, a little bit of torture. Absolutely. Alma, Alicia, are you a are you an adventurous eater? I uh, like Claudie. I I um I like to go and try new things in new places. Um, up until last year, I lived in Germany, so I was in Germany for the last eleven years. So I loved going around and having little trips and going to food halls. I think you can learn a lot about different cultures how by what they have in their food halls, especially in Europe, because I feel like every city has one. Um, so I try a lot of things. I would not say I'm one to try alligator or or um, kangaroo. That's not really for me, but I will try a lot of other things. Well, uh, the kangaroo thing, um, uh, nobody on this panel is uh, old enough to have eaten in McDonald's in 1979, but they did get in trouble for having an entire warehouse full of ground kangaroo meat that they said was not theirs. Oh my, uh, but yeah, oh my, that was a thing back in the day as well, for sure. Oh my, Stephanie, are you a, uh, uh, are you an adventurous eater? I try to be, uh, similar to the others on the panel. I do like to try local foods when I'm traveling. I also have a geek girl brunch group that I run here in Phoenix, and we try to hit up locally owned restaurants and see whatever's on the menu. For some reason, I cannot... Um, enjoy the taste of fish. I've tried it many times and continue to try it, but it's just not my thing. But other than that, um, you know, even with fish, I still keep trying it because I feel like everyone tells me I just haven't had the right fish yet. So I'll keep trying, I guess, but. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say you really need to push that, um, uh, especially in Arizona, where every fish is not going to be local. <laughs> Agree. Agree. I, oh my uh it's funny you'll be i don't know I'm making an example but you'll be in miami and they'll be like oh the special of today is salmon and you're like yeah no no that's been around for way too long i do not want to have that oh my uh tracy definitely an adventurous eater do you have any examples that you want to talk about adventurous things that you've had um gosh i you know i, I was listening to everybody else's examples i i, I think i would be an example I would consider myself an adventurous eater. I would not do rodent the same way um, Baroth would, wouldn't. There's no, no thanks. I'm, I'm good with those staying far away from me. They were like responsible for a plague. Like I don't want those. <laughs> um, I guess in terms of just like really kind of 
intense adventurous food there is a filipino food called balut which is like a duck egg and it's not like a cute little you know like not like the the you crack open the egg and it's like a, a um like the chicken eggs where like a yolk falls out this is like kind of like weird half-formed baby duckling it is not my cup of tea but i have tried it once just to be able to say that we've tried it but it's like oh no no oh, no let's go let's go further into this so not only is balut as you say a, a, a fertilized egg that has not been finished, but also it is preserved for a decent amount of time. So you really get that funk when you crack the egg. Um, I, I, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's a thousand year old egg. Um, I, uh, in a way, but yeah, oh my, uh, I draw the I think line. It was on, I, um, I think it was on like Fear Factor or one of those. And I remember like somebody, someone was like, oh, I ate that. And I was like, oh yeah, I just, we did. I just searched it on google image oh no, why would you do this <laughs> i encourage other people to not do what i do <laughs> I, I, I was gonna say i draw the line at balut I, I know a lot of adventurous eaters i love to do it absolutely eating a lot of crazy things draw the line just below balut but it reminds would you try me it bro would i try it no i would, thing is, I would I not would I, no. I would not try it good good yeah I would, I would not try it no I'm gonna. Yeah, I just like. I'm, I'm, try, to I'm gonna try to go to bed tonight, too. think not thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, you're you're reminding me as well with that. Of I, I, it was an opening scene in a, a, a Anthony Bourdain book, but it also turns out it was a scene in Succession, on my in season three, I think, I of the I, I, endangered French sparrow. Oh my, uh, you're not allowed to eat. And so the tradition is to take a, a, a napkin, take your napkin and put it over your face so that when you eat it, there are no witnesses that you actually ate it. But oh my, uh, part of this is uh, uh, that you're eating like this tiny sparrow, oh my, uh, bones and all. And the bones, as they stab into your mouth, and the iron taste that comes with it is considered part of the experience. You could say it's part of the taste to have that. It sounds like one of like, Claudia, you were mentioning of the, the socioeconomic stratus thing of like only the rich people eat the super yeah. endangered sparrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Hi. Oh my, uh, well, yes, this. Okay. So I, I said that about politics didn't really land, but socioeconomics, you know, um, I, uh, do you guys find that when you're using, you know, writing in your books, uh, uh, using food or in stuff that you read that you really like, uh, do you find that you are uh, uh, giving characters, you know, like a, a, a social stratus, a, a social stratus based on what you're having them eat? What do you think, Alicia? Maybe. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I write uh YA sci-fi as well so um in a lot of those it's in the first one the sound of stars the world has been like decimated by the alien invasion so she's traveling around and she's finding whatever she can eat and she just eats it um and it's a lot of peanut butter and like carrots in a can and stuff like this so it's not really um it's re really whatever you can find and the kindred it's aliens going to earth <laughs> and like just enjoying what earthlings eat and they find that really funny but um one of the characters is very well off and very very rich um so for him he just like it's a lot to take in that there's so much processed food and it's not as beautiful and it's not in a feast form and um and then in a song of salvation it's food is like on the last like the last thing in that book because it's just like a space adventure there's you know it's so little but um it's really enjoyable and then with just a pinch of magic it's food is like the whole is a huge part of that book it's just that is the book and the magic that it is and you know food being an expression and how you are saying i love you to somebody else so yes in that, in i think there's a place for it in that they're not having caviar you know Oh yeah. my, what are some examples of what they're eating in a, in that book? In Just a Pinch? A yes, Pinch of Magic, yeah. Um, I make a lot, of, it's a lot of pastries because it's a bakery, 
but I do like Gougere and um, like, you know, all kinds of croissants and eclairs and they have like the emotion attached to it. So if you eat like an energizing eclair, you'll eat that and you'll have energy for like two days. You'll just be feeling really energized. Um, and it's just all like that and like calming croissant or, um, and it all kind of goes together and it's really, really fun. Heck yeah. No, that's super fun. Absolutely. Oh my, uh, Clonty, can I ask, what is your favorite, all oh my, uh, what is your favorite fictional meal? I thought I tried to think of one ahead of time and I don't really have one except for the Asterix um, feast at the end, which is like a frequent meal that they have. But otherwise, like a, a specific dish that I've seen, I don't have one. Uh, so I would have to go with that. That's you've already answered the question. That's that's totally correct. Absolutely. Oh, my uh, broth. Now, I know you love the the uh, uh, the feasts in Asterisk, but do you have do you have a favorite fictional meal? Yeah, uh, probably. I, you know, I, I love calamari. Uh, so I'm going to go with the crispy squid, well, the crispy squid balls from the twice lucky in uh, Jade City. Heck yeah. Oh, my uh, Stephanie. I was also trying to think of something that I recently read Legends and Lattes and literally everything they added to the menu. I wanted like 15 of them. So that's probably the one that I'm thinking of right now. I was just reading that and I, I you had mentioned that like in the chat and I was like, oh, that's cool. And I was reading it and they weren't that different. I was like, you know, kind of thinking this is going to be magical and stuff like that. But no, they were like, we're here in the medieval times, you know, with orcs and goblins and all that, we are inventing the latte, you know, like, like we are inventing the cinnamon roll. Mm -hmm. And that was so funny for them to give normal things to a fantasy world, like that all of us will recognize. That was so cute. I agree. I loved it. Alma, um, uh, Tracy, what do you think? Um, I, I can't think of a of like a certain dish that I think I would love, but I will tell you one that I was sorely disappointed in. It's when I find like, when you read all the Narnia books and you're like, wow, what is Turkish delight? This must be amazing. And then you have it, you're like, this is really <laughs> underwhelming. And I don't know why this would be the major like kind of driving factor for one of the kids. So that's one that I will not, I will always remember as like the disappointment. <laughs> That is a lovely inversion. Absolutely. Oh my, uh, Alicia, what do you think? What's your favorite fictional meal? Uh, I'd have to think. I really loved, um, there's some really old ones where, you know, like uh, um, in Babette's Feast, which is really, I think is an old, older one. Yeah, but when you're when you're going into food writing, you have to read all of these things. Babette's Feast and like Water for Chocolate. And I think with like water for chocolate, they have like a really, a lot of beautiful things that sounded delicious. But if I, if I'm going to go with what I really, really wanted, it was um, the movie Chocolat. And yeah. I mean, <laughs> all of it, so, right? I mean, what are you going to like, what are you going to do with that? It was gorgeous. It was so well done. And because I had watched that and I was going to pastry school, I went into my major was chocolate. So I was a I became a chocolatier because I love the movement of making chocolate so much. And, you know, the, of course there's a lot of science to it. That's really, I will not describe for you, but just making that and enjoying that and all the things you can do with chocolate has just that because of that movie, it inspired my career but it also like inspires me whenever I'm out and I want to try a new chocolate place. I'm like, Oh, I've got to try this. That's awesome. No, all my, I uh, like, you know, when you, when you're really into it, you know, and, and you want to see beautiful, all my things, I think that you hit on something there as well. All my, in that like theoretical person, that Redditor commenter, all my, I, uh, which is if you're complaining about food in your, you know, books you're not looking for beauty and maybe it is something about like i don't care about food as we talked about stephanie you know like not being connected to like a family or a found family getting together with people that might have an effect on it but also you're not looking for beauty you know in if the same person says 
I read Tom Clancy, then I'm going to be like, yo, you are fine with utter ridiculous details that don't matter to the plot at all. You just don't want them to be beautiful, like some of these descriptions of food can be. Oh, my. Uh, thank you guys so much for an awesome conversation. I do want to leave with one little thing for sure. Oh, my. Uh, and then ask. And, then, and it's a little question. This is a, the new one that I'm reading, The uh, the Spare Man um, uh, by Marie Robinette Kowal. Oh my, and each uh, uh, par each uh, chapter starts off with a recipe for a cocktail. Most of them are simple. It's an old fashioned, it's a Manhattan. And I don't think that they really apply to it, but this one is pretty funny. It's, it, it's Amal's Hospitality. Half of a yellow bell pepper, de-seeded and muddled, six ounces of tonic water, an ounce of lime juice, a dash of cardamom bitters and fresh ground pepper. Muddle bell pepper in the bottom of a rocks glass, add single large cube of ice, tonic water, lime juice, and bitters, stir till cold, grind black pepper for light garnish. That does not sound delicious, but since it is names Amal's Hospitality, and that is a character who is very important in that chapter, that's one of those things where that food is telling you something about them. Yellow bell pepper in a cocktail and, and no liquor in the cocktail, by the way, as well. <laughs> um, uh, like, makes me feel like she wrote that to just do something about the character. All my uh, Studio Ghibli, all my uh, different films, different books, all my uh, back to Redwall and, you know, who the baker is. Do you guys have an example, perhaps I can ask, all my, uh, of a time when a food exemplified or told something about a character that you loved? All my uh, broth, can I put you on the spot? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just cite my own work. Um, Please. So in, uh, you know, the, the Privilege series um, of a bunch of basic white people who can't eat any exotic food at all. Um, and they have other negative traits as well to make it clear that they're not supposed to be likable characters. Uh, but I do like to lead with the food. So when they pull out the oatmeal, you know, you know that they're going to get killed <laughs> in the next scene. Absolutely. Just, yeah. you know, they're not even putting sugar on top. All my, uh, Tracy, what do you think about, you know, a good time that a character was exemplified by food? I mean, this is a quick plug for um, Alicia's book of Just a Pinch of Magic, which I got, I was lucky enough to read an early copy of, but there's like recipes and everything in there. And like the they actually kind of lead like bleed into the story like the characters will make them so um it's you know it's it's all like really greatly woven together and delicious that's great thank you heck yeah all my uh stephanie do you do you have a response i saw you thinking pensively on the uh on the question i was trying to think um there was a book I was reading recently where the main characters came home and their mom was making ropa vieja. So that made me kind of identify with the character a little bit. Also, um, there was an Autumn Nights anthology that came out and one of my friends wrote a story about a boy who goes to the circus without his parents knowing and he buys a hot dog, which is forbidden in his family. So it kind of made me want to add that to my grocery list the next day. Nice. No, I, I would love that if it was like, there's a character in a book and her name is Emily and they go home and her mom is cooking ropa vieja and listen to cumbia and you get a very different definition of what Emily's family is like for sure. Alma, Alicia, what do you think? Oh, I have like so many, <laughs> but then at the same time, my brain is like, oh, no, no. Um, I think... I'm going to go with Tracy's The Takeout because, because Tracy does food so well, but because Tracy knows how to add the food in that makes it feel like it's, it's not just that it's part of the story. It's that it is a part of these characters and that they 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 kind of stand in for each other, you know, and there's so much, there's this beautiful culture and there's like in the fusion with the takeout, um, but it all feels just so atmospheric at the same time as you, there's so much depth to it, like the food, that you're just like, you feel really warm and loved 
And I think that's like, that's the takeaway that's from the takeout. Oh, um, is that, you know, it's family and it's warmth and it's love and it's depth and it's all these things. And when somebody's taking that from you, what do you do? And I just, I love, I love Tracy's work. That's great. No, thank you. Absolutely. All my, uh, and I, uh, I will finish with asking Claudia the same thing and assume that it will be asterisk that beautiful feast at the end. Uh, I mean, it's one, uh, but I would like to go back to um, the mango verse that I mentioned earlier, because Aviva is the uh, queen's cook and lover, and the love and care that she puts in the food that she makes, because the queen cannot eat anything uh, with gluten, because she's celiac, and that's that was like plot point of the first book, and then it just becomes a recurring element, and it just, there's just so much care in in how she treats the food that she makes, uh, and there's just in the books in general, so much uh, love and the food that's made for the celebrations, because there's a lot of Jewish holidays throughout the series. It's I think that one exemplifies both characters and the world it's set in. And it's so as far as food is concerned, that's a very important book for me. So, yeah, but I think too. <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you. Heck yeah. So we're right about at the end of our time. Thank you guys so much for uh, uh, joining me on my talking about food, which is so important to me. And I'm awesome. It's so awesome that it's glad to you that it's important to y'all as well. All my, I'm Sean Carroll, all my uh, host of a uh, writer's lunch and editor with Tomeworks. And you can find me anywhere online at Buffalo Sean. All my, that's S-E-A-N spelled the Irish way. Uh, Alicia, do you want to tell anybody where they can find you online? Um, yeah, I'm on uh, Instagram as Alicia Dow, A-L-E-C-H-A-D-O-W, um, and the same on Twitter as well. And I have my website, which is aliciadow.com. Nice. Claudia, what do you what do you say? Where can people find the next thing you're doing? What are you doing online? I am mostly on Twitter and Instagram right now on uh, Instagram as Claudia Sonneau. Um, and my website is also claudiasonneau.com. Uh, Twitter is a little more complicated because it's a chemistry bun on my name. So it's C-L-H-2-O-A-R-S. Um, but yes, that's mostly where you can find me at the moment. Nice. Heck yeah. Well, by the time this is uh, uh, posted up, it, uh, Twitter may absolutely have it loaded. <laughs> well, we're not really worried about that. Absolutely. Uh, Tracy. Yeah, I'm at tracybadua.com, T-R-A-C-Y-B-A-D-U-A. I'm also on Instagram at Tracy Badua Writes and also on Twitter, which may or may not exist, at Tracy B. Writes. Thank you, Stephanie. I am on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Latina Geek Girl, also latinageekgirl.com. And I am regularly in the Right Hive Discord, so you can definitely find me there too, also at Latina Geek Girl. Yay. Uh, Barath, leaving you for the end. Um, I, I, what can you plug? What you talking about? Yeah, sure. So you can find me hanging out in the Right Hive Discord as well. And on Instagram, just my name, B-H-A-R-A-T-K-R-I-S-H-N-A-N-1213. Uh, and I also just launched a Patreon. That is patreon.com slash skin grafters, which is a slur I made up in my books. And you can learn more about them. Nice. Also, quick plug for I uh, uh, be on the lookout for Right Hives, I uh, 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 silent auction coming up with lots of great auction items from different authors who are part of the Right Hive conference this year. That's Barath's little baby, and that will be happening in November, December, December coming up this year. So keep your eyes peeled for it on any of the social media sites that may or may not exist in the near future. Thank you guys so much. Have a great night. Bye.